Everyone, good evening and thank you for joining us this evening. If by any chance we drop off this call, we've had some uh, internet instability here. Um, please um, just rejoin using the same uh, link that you just used. Tonight is um, the end of Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, and we're happy to be able to host on this day um, the annual Van Tine Lecture um, at Centenary College of Louisiana featuring Mr. Nico Van Tine. I'm Dr. Lisa Nicoletti, Professor of Art History and Visual Studies at Centenary. The Van Tine Lecture was initiated by Sheldon and Rochelle Goldshaw in 2009 to honor local beloved Holocaust survivors, Rose and Louis Van Tine, the parents of tonight's guest speaker, and to address the subject of oppression caused by anti-Semitism, racism, and bigotry. The generosity and vision of these community members who adored Rose and Louis ensured the lecture series would commemorate the Holocaust on Centenary's campus annually. Centenary is so very grateful to the nearly 100 donors who contributed to the Van Tine lecture series. Sadly, bigotry and hatred remain real threats today. In 2019, the FBI reported that more than 60% of religion-based hate crimes in the United States were aimed at Jews, a tiny minority of the American population. A poll last month by the Anti-Defamation League showed that 63% of Jews in the United States have experienced or witnessed anti-Semitic acts in the last five years. There was a 150% rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans in 2020. Hate, intolerance, injustice, and inequity continue to plague our world today. Before we get, begin, any centenary students, you can earn passport points later in this talk to expand your cultural awareness and horizons, and I will share the code with you later. Um, also, please note, that this Sunday, Shreveport Bossier's 38th annual Holocaust Remembrance Service will take place. That's this Sunday, April 11th, from 3 o'clock to 4.30. It's going to be an online stream live from Broadmoor United Methodist Church. So you can go to the Broadmoor United Methodist Church website um, to see the live stream. Nico Van Tine spent most of his early life in Shreveport. He graduated from Woodlawn and Louisiana Tech and had a 45-year-old career as a sports journalist. Um, he published a book about his parents um, in 2016, and he has so much amazing information to share with us tonight, as well as really great uh, images. Um, great historical photographs that I want to turn over uh, the Zoom to him right away. He would like to begin by sharing um, a video of his mother um, giving testimony. So we'll start with that. And I hope, I so hope there is not going to be a commercial at the beginning of this. We've loaded everything, but sometimes, um, unfortunately, on YouTube, there will be commercials, so forgive me if there is one. And like I said, when I meant to Auschwitz, I wasn't religious, you know, because I wasn't brought up religious. I prayed more in two and a half years in concentration camps than that I had prayed 21 years before. I talked to God a lot. And there were times that I asked God to let me die. And then there were times that I asked God to let me live because I really wanted to live. And uh, I mean, the experiments were. Oh. 
so that we would get in later. No, so when I came out of the uh, sorry, just one car, second. The car next to me was uh, more. We're going to listen to that video in just a minute. Now we'll look at this video. A steady stream of survivors has traveled to Poland, survivors of one of history's most terrible chapters. We call Martha Teichner's report for those who come after a remembrance of the Auschwitz death camp 75 years after its liberation. The pictures were an afterthought. Once Soviet soldiers had liberated Auschwitz in January 1945, they needed to show the world the horror they had discovered. So they dressed survivors back up in their uniforms and paraded them around for the cameras. Human beings, the Nazis reduced to numbers. The little boy on the right, B-1148, four years old then. His name is Michael Bornstein. Now 79, uh, he lives in New Jersey. So here I am. And I tells his story in schools. I was prisoner B-1148. I don't know if you can see this tattoo. That girl in the back row, nine years old. Number A-60989. I, oh, I am right over here. Ruth Mushkis Weber from Michigan, 84 now. Now, did you as a child there, understand what was happening at Auschwitz. The woman told me, they gave me the, uh, the number, that if I don't behave myself, I'll go up and smoke. Ruth Weber, Michael Bornstein, they were among the 200 or so survivors who went back last month to mark the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Fewer and fewer of them left. They sat in a tent covering their ground zero, the spot where the railroad tracks ended, where the cattle cars filled with people stopped. The truth about the Holocaust must not die. This tribute to the living was also an elegy, a lament for the dead. 1.1 million people died at Auschwitz, most of them Jews. Mainly, they were herded into gas chambers and then incinerated in adjoining crematoria. Efficiently, as many as 6,000 a day. Auschwitz I was the camp with the famous gate. Its motto, work makes you free, a mockery to anyone who passed under it. Auschwitz II was its much bigger neighbor at Birkenau. This is what's left of the crematoria there. And this is where they dump the ashes of the people they killed. You think you're prepared for what you'll see, the evidence of mass murder, but you're not. The children's shoes, what it says, look at this, this child, couldn't be more than two or three years old. Cosmetics billionaire Ronald Lauder helped raise the $40 million it cost to open a conservation lab at Auschwitz. If it wasn't for a place like this, these shoes would have been for this time for. This unforgettable vacation. Oh, boy. Okay, with that, Nico, do you want to load your PowerPoint and take it away? Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, we want to thank Lisa particularly and her husband, Steve Alexander. Uh, Lisa's been the guiding force for this program for more than a decade, and she and Steve were such great friends to, to my parents. In fact, they were like adopted kids. Uh, once Elsa and I left the house, Steve and, and Lisa stepped in for us. Uh, thanks, too, to Kate Pedrotti for her role in setting up the Zoom meeting. 
uh, her parents, Camille and, and Chuck Meehan, were also among my parents' special friends in Shreveport. Uh, my parents were aware of this, of this program uh, and the fact that the, the Van Thine Eminent Scholars Endowed Leadership was uh, established. Uh, this happened before they, they passed. Uh, the, the, the funds were raised in 2008, which was the year dad died and 2009 and many of, of uh, my parents' friends and, and uh, my younger sister Elsa's friends contributed. Most were from Shreveport Bossier, but not all. And uh, contributions came from all over, including Holland and Israel. It was a, an impressive list and the state of Louisiana contributed a 40,000 grant. And we're forever grateful for those contributions and uh, the, the chair and this program. I've attended several of the programs in the past. It's an honor to be here in this format this year. I wish I could do it live, but, but that's the way it is. Uh, to tell you the truth, I actually asked Lisa if I could do the program this year. I just wanted to refresh what mom's and dad's mission was, so to speak, and, and that's to talk about the, the Holocaust and about their story. Uh, many of you have heard or, or seen portions of what I'm gonna present today. Uh, so bear with me. I have updated the slideshow and I'm going to try to bring it up right now and hopefully it'll work. Uh, there you go. And so um, that's just the, the uh, recap of, of what we just talked about. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with my parents. Each of them spent some 28 months in concentration camps, specifically the most famous of all, uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. This was two and a half years after the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands, which is where mom was living, and Belgium, which is where dad moved to uh, from Amsterdam when he was 16, and he, he went to Belgium in hopes of becoming a diamond cutting, cutting apprentice. Uh, their stories are, are bittersweet. It's great tragedy and loss turned into a happy ending. They were lucky to live long lives, but uh, the sad part is once they went to the camps, they never saw any of their original families again. This is our family in uh, 1956, or right, right at the start of uh, 56 actually in October 55, as you see, we came to the United States to Shreveport, Louisiana, of all places, um, in 56 as immigrants, thanks to the sponsorship of the Shreveport Jewish Federation. Specifically, our big benefactors were Mr. A.A. A. Gilbert and his family. Mr. Gilbert provided my dad with a job in the pipe yard, uh, dealing in mostly secondhand oil field pipe and not smoking pipes, which my dad first thought was what the job was gonna be. And it was a job that he had for 29 years. Uh, the Gilbert family was so good to us in so many ways and they still are. Now, here's what we're dealing with, uh, the Nazi ideology. As you know, the Holocaust deniers are still out there. It's kind of unbelievable, isn't it? But it's, that's the way it is. There are also the neo-Nazis, the far right, the fascist, the white supremacist, anti-Semitics, the conspiracy theorists, those who believe that this is a white world and that whites, especially those with European roots, are superior to everyone else and everyone else be damned. So here's what haunts us today. You, you remember this, certainly. Um, it's right here in the United States. Just look around you and we're seeing attacks on blacks, on Hispanics, and now on Asian Americans, and it's increasing uh, every day. And yes, of course, the attacks are on the Jewish people too. You might know some of the names and groups that are they're involved. Jason Kessler, Richard Spencer, who's from Dallas, the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and of course, David Duke. And uh, some of those people were among the clowns who were at, the, at Charlottesville and they likely showed up at the US Capitol on January 6th. As you know, you can see right here and, and here's the story that the anti-Semitism was seen in the Capitol insurrection. 
Um, I'm not saying that that was uh, aimed towards the Jews, but you had a guy like this and the Camp Auschwitz shirt, which is just unbelievable. Um, back to Charlottesville, of course, um, the Friday night march with the burning torches was so reminiscent of the KKK and then the chants of Jews will not replace us, whose land our land and blood and soil were all reminiscent of the Nazi chants in the 1930s. And on Saturday, there was the violence with the, the one idiot running his car through the crowd and killing a young woman, 30 people wounded. That far right crowd came spoiling for violence. It was obvious if you saw the, uh, the way they were dressed and if you saw the behind the scenes videos on VOX, a news website, you saw how vile and angry and profane and how out of bounds a lot of that crowd was. And some people want to blame the Antifa movement, which is the far left. Um, and yeah, some of those people are, are spoiling for a fight too, but they're, they're uh, ready to defend themselves from attacks and compared to the far right, it's a very small crowd. It's, there's no central organization. There's no named groups. And look, we don't condone any violence. Uh, you may have heard it said that there were very fine people on both sides. And that's not only wrong, that's loud wrong. There cannot be good people who are neo-Nazis. I'm sorry. Who support the Nazi cause? I wrote this on my blog when it happened. I'm saying it again now. This is my red line. It was and it is unacceptable to, to condone any of these people. There also was the, uh, the massacre at the Pittsburgh synagogue in 2018, when one anti-Semitic nutcase, uh, as shown by his social media content, entered the Tree of Life congregation, shot 11 Jewish wor worshipers dead, injured four police officers, and wounded other people. And that guy, who's 46 then, uh, has not yet been put on trial. But you know, all the all the mass shootings of the, the black people in, in the Charleston church, the people gathered in Las Vegas, the kids at Sandy Hook, and the attacks on the Asian American women in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago, they're all hurt. They all hurt. It's, it's far more than Jewish people being attacked. Here's a story um, that came across just a few weeks ago, talking about the rise of the, the mil militias and the white supremacists. And that's coming out of a, a report delivered to Congress. Here's the fact that uh, FBI statistics show us 37% rise in anti-Semitic action in the last three years. And then this silly story from a couple of weeks ago, just unbelievable high school football coach out there calling signals and and making references to, to Auschwitz and to uh, Hitler. And you can see this if you can read it. Uh, and the trouble is not only in the United States, it's really, really severe in Europe. Um, for the centenary students, I want you to copy this link that's right here at the top. And I, I would like to tell you to, to watch that video. It shows you what's going on in Germany. Um, and you can see the headlines here that the far right parties are making gains and uh, that the pandemic has helped increase that. But a lot of it has to do with immigration. Uh, same problems we have here on our border. The people in Europe are seeing people come in from, from Syria and Iraq and Morocco and, and all these places. And uh, They've got quite a problem in Europe too. And so this is what my mother feared. This is what she talked about. For 25 years, she would go out and talk about her Holocaust story. You can see the photos of her in her element, talking to students, talking to, to groups. Um, this was her mission, this, to tell her story, to tell what happened to her and dad and to express repeatedly that this world needs more tolerance, more understanding, more acceptance of people who are not the same as us, and that there's no place in this world for hate speech. 
She was uh, a prolific writer. She always prepared her speeches. Um, she always had some great one-liners because she, although it was a serious subject, she had a zany off, offbeat sense of humor too. She wrote letters to the editors of the Shreveport Times and the Shreveport Journal, and she wrote poetry about the Holocaust, uh, some of which was published. She spoke to civic groups, churches, military bases. Uh, she was a speaker annually at the uh, Shreveport Bossier Holocaust Memorial Service and in services in other Louisiana cities. And she especially liked speaking to younger people in schools from all ages, and she had a special tie-in to Centenary. You can see her here. She was speaking right up to near, near the end. She spoke at Centenary. Uh, her and dad would take a week and go to, to speak at Centenary to students. You can see dad here. Uh, the joke was that he went along with it as, as the designated driver. And mom spoke at uh, Brown Chapel at Centenary a lot. Um, and here's her special relationship with Centenary. She received a, a, a doctor's degree, honorary doctor's degree. And um, she became Dr. Rose. She was really proud of that. And so were we. And then here she is with former Centenary President Donald Webb and the, the man in the background I'm sure Kate Pedrotti knows, knows him because that's her dad. That's Chuck Meehan. So at the end, mom um, asked that we have her service at Brown Chapel. And then we honored her with this uh, monument on the Centenary campus in the Rose Garden. Pretty nice, a rose for the Rose Garden. Now, um, My parents, uh, the story begins in Amsterdam, which of course is my home city before Shreveport, before Fort Worth and several other stops. Uh, just a great city, uh, very proud of it. Love going back there, been back three times, hope to go again. And it begins with these two, two young people. Uh, this, this is the, these pictures are probably in the mid thirties and um, you can see that uh, they're pretty young. They were, they were both married at this point, other people. And this is the story, uh, the first story written on my parents in Louisiana, in Shreveport in 1957. We had uh, been here a year. And um, a little bit about um, their story. Okay, first of all, this is this is why I can say to these Holocaust deniers, no, you're not right. This this happened. These two people can tell you that it happened. Now, the background on my mother. She was in Auschwitz's infamous Block 10, which was the medical experiment block. She and the others there were subjected to repeated attempts to sterilize them. They were trying to prevent them from reproducing and thus wiping out future Jewish generations. Mom said she took hundreds of shots in her chest and down below, and she and the other women were burned repeatedly by an x-ray machine when they tried, which was designed to burn up their reproductive organs. And while many of the surviving women could never have children, mom obviously was very lucky. Elsa and I are proof of that. Three times word came that trucks were backing up to their uh, barracks or their bunk or whatever they called the block, that they were coming to take them to the gas chambers. Once they even got loaded on the buses. Each time something happened and uh, something intervened and, and so they survived. My mother also survived a death march near the end of the war when the women in Auschwitz were forced to walk uh, because the Nazis feared the, the advancing Allied troops, mostly Americans from the South and West and the Russian Red Army from the East. So they had a day's long walk, some 600 miles in one of the coldest winters in European history 
not many clothes, not many shoes. My mother was walking on planks at, at little uh, planks at one point, and uh, they walked 600 miles to another women's camp, Ravensbrook, which was one of the most notorious women's camps. Uh, mom never survived uh, or barely survived. She never talked about this. She never acknowledged it, but we, we found out from her friends on that march that she was so ill. And remember, she's only about six, about four foot 10, and she's practically starved for two years. And she might have weighed only like 60, 70 pounds. So she got really sick and she had to go to the hospital. Um, they were rescued by the Russians, actually, from uh, in Ravensbrook, but um, they, they, uh, went and negotiated for to go to an American camp, which was right across the bridge. It took them several days to negotiate that. And uh, the Russians, a lot of the Russians were interested only in, in uh, having sex with, the, with the, the bedraggled Auschwitz prisoners. So anyway, it's kind of a, a miracle she made it. Uh, Dad was also in Auschwitz uh, for part of the two and a half years but he volunteered to go to the nearby mining camps. He, he, there were two of them. Uh, he thought that it might be a little easier. Of course it wasn't, the work was hard, but it did get him out of the main Auschwitz camp and a little ways from the gas chambers and the smell of human flesh. Still, he saw enough horrible events and he took at least three or four uh, terrible beatings for what the Nazis thought were transgressions. Um, but one time he got caught stealing a couple of potatoes out of the kitchen. They beat the hell out of him that time. Another time he, he saw a coat laying around and it was rarely cold and he, he went over and picked up the coat, put it on. Well, it happened that that coat belonged to a capo, which was a, one of the guards, which actually were German prisoners. They weren't Nazis, they were German prisoners that they had uh, recruited to, to, to watch guard over the Auschwitz prisoners and other camps. Um, anyway, they didn't like him wearing that, that capo's coat, so they beat the hell out of him again. And then uh, the last of, the, of these beatings uh, probably saved his life. I'll come back to that. So my parents suffered the humiliation, the harassment, and the torture at times. Uh, there was, a, of course, a tremendous lack of sanitation, uh, and their life in the barracks was was uh, terrible with the hard bunks and not much bedding. My mother was small enough that she could get on the top bunk, which was uh, which kept her away from the German shepherds, who who the uh, guards brought into the into the uh, block. And Mom said that the women guards were often far more sadistic than the men guards. Uh, there were some awful, god awful sights. Um, one example was when dad was, was in the camp and they caught six prisoners trying to escape from the camp, okay? They caught them. Well, they, they built some barracks, I mean some barracks, some um, gallows, and they made all the prisoners in the camp stand outside at attention for like six hours, just a days long standing there, and then they, and then they had to watch those men being hung. And as my dad said in his accent, they wanted to scare you to death. And um, there was the starvation, the very little to eat for days and days, maybe a potato cooked or raw, a piece of bread or two, and something to drink, a, a dirty brown liquid that the Nazis called soup. And my mother said she always called it mud. Um, but the years of starvation uh, led to this, my, my parents, as you might imagine, loved to eat. Once they got out of those camps, they spent uh, a lot of the, the next 60 years uh, having some fine meals. Now, the most visible symbols of the Holocaust, of course, are the tattoos. Uh, they didn't ask for these. These uh, were their only body marks, really, um, only tattoos they ever had. You can see my mother's tattoo. Um, you know, and, and, and this is, I mean, when, when you see these Holocaust deniers, you know, and you say, hey, what about these numbers? You know, how are you going to explain those? And this, uh, my mother uh, and dad both uh, used these in uh, their talks 
you know, this was a great show and tell item, as was the, the, the yellow star of David that the, the Jewish people were required to wear before uh, when the Nazis took over Holland and Belgium and they made all the Jews wear, you know, register and then they had wear the yellow star. Um, here's dad's tattoo. It was, it was quite prominent. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times that I saw people go up and ask my dad about this number and my mother but particularly my dad, because his number just really stood out. It was, it was pretty large, as you can see. Uh, the, the triangle here is, it signifies Jew. Uh, there, were, there were also symbols for um, the Roma and for gays. And uh, the Germans were meticulous. The Nazis were meticulous record keepers. Once the prisoners got these numbers and they got them, you know, right after they arrived at the camps and they were shaved of their, of their hair and they had to, to go naked and go take ice cold showers. And then they were tattooed with these numbers. And because there were a lot of foreign names, um, they, this became their identity. You know, my dad was no longer Louis. He was 70726. Um, but along with the tattoos, of course, the, the biggest thing for, for my parents and for so many was the loss of life. Uh, like I said, my parents never saw their families again. Here's my dad's family. Uh, you can see my dad here on the left. He's, he's uh, fairly little still here, eight years old. Um, my, my grandfather was Nathan. Most people called him Nico. Uh, my, my dad's mother was Sarah. And then they had another child a little boy here, you can see this is uh, my dad's oldest brother's wedding. Uh, and Johnny is right up front here. Jonas was his given name, but they call him Johnny. He's 10 and he was put to death. And my dad, of all the things that hurt my dad, the loss of his little brother hurt him the most. He talked about that some. Uh, Hyman had a had a, a wife. He, the, he married Regina here on this. This is in Amsterdam, and uh, they had a one-year-old son named Nico. So the last his his name was exactly the same as mine, uh, first and last name. And this is the last time Dad saw his family. Here's my mother's family. Uh, my dad, my granddad was a was a very interesting man. He uh, he was a teacher of Esperanto, which was a universal language. Um, my mother. Uh, my grandmother, uh, is named Rachel. She was a stay-at-home mom, as you can see. Uh, this is my aunt, Ann, Anna. Uh, my sister's middle name is Anna. Uh, and here they are, again, the Lopez Diaz girls. My mother's maiden name was, was Portuguese. Her, her ancestors, uh, two or three generations before, came from Portugal to Holland. Uh, and as you can see, uh, our, our daughter is named Rachel for her great grandmother. Um, this picture um, is in the Holocaust Museum. Uh, somebody pointed out to me that it was on their website. Uh, I had seen the picture. Uh, as you can see, the, the stars of David on their clothing. Um, this, the woman, in the picture with mom, Lena Green did not survive. She died in the camps, okay? The good part is both of them had some survivors. Uh, cousin Mauritz here in the middle, he's, he's about 10 years old here. Uh, my mom and him were the best of friends before the war. And then afterward, he was one of the few people that survived. He, mama, mom had 35 first cousins and this was her favorite one. And if you'll read the thing, he, he uh, survived. He became a journalist. I was not the first journalist in my family. Uh, he was a hell of a lot better than me. <laughs> um, he was a, a great writer on Jewish matters and he was editor of the Jewish newspaper in Amsterdam for 25 years. And uh, his kids are uh, the closest relatives we have outside of our family. Uh, the, his daughter lives in Antwerp his son lives in Jerusalem. Here's dad. Uh, this is his journey. This, he was in the Dutch army. 
when when uh, the Germans came into to Holland and took over, the Nazis came in. Dad was in the Dutch army. He was taken as a POW. I don't think he was in any any fighting. Not that he ever told me, but um, he's uh, he was taken as a POW. But the, they basically did nothing with the POWs at that point. Uh, they'd send them to a, a camp in, in Eastern Holland and, they, and dad said they sat around for six weeks and he just, uh, they, and then they released him. And then so he goes back to Antwerp, which is where he was living with his aunt and, and uh, working odd jobs, waiting to, to go into diamond cutting. Dad also met Estella there. Uh, he married her uh, when he came back from, from being a POW and uh, they live with her parents and this is their wedding photo and and dad kept this photo in his billfold always uh, with my mother's permission. Um, so uh, I, f I got these, these are their cards that are in the Belgian Holocaust Museum. These were the cards when they went, when they were picked up and went to the, to the uh, holding camps they made these, these uh, uh, placards for them. And this means overladen means dad lived. And uh, this means that Estella died. Um, my cousin in Antwerp, I knew these existed, but the Belgian Holocaust Museum wanted like $250 each. And I thought that was a bit much. And I knew that my cousin in Antwerp would go there eventually and she shot these pictures for us and sent them to us just a couple of years ago. Here's some more survivors on dad's side. Uh, my dad's first sister-in-law, Afe, was, uh, I remember her, I remember Maurits too, uh, the, the co mom's cousin. I knew all these people in Holland. I was eight years old, so I, I knew these people. Afe babysat me quite a bit. Uh, you can read her bio here. She, they were my parents' best friends. She married a, a survivor who had a, a little son who was hidden away. Uh, he lost his, his wife, his first wife. And uh, Afe was, she was great. She babysat me many a day. You can tell here on the right, she has a Holocaust number on, on her arm. Uh, she was a big Auschwitz memorial worker and she was a communist party member. And you can imagine some of the conversations between my mother and Afe. Quite interesting. Okay. Um, then uh, my dad also, this is his first cousin, one of his first cousins. Um, this man um, also survived, lost his first wife, lost a, a little baby daughter. Um, and uh, he remarried a, a, a French woman and he was a diamond cutter. He did become a diamond cutter. He did quite well. He and dad stayed close their whole lives. Here's dad on the, on the far left at, at Yopi's wedding. Uh, and then they met, uh, dad went over there several times. Uh, Yopi never came to the United States. Uh, actually, Maurits and his family did, but, but Yopi did not. But dad, um, and when Yopi died, his wife had died already and Yopi made dad, uh, his heir, dad got all of Yopi's uh, stuff, except the French government kept about 65% of it. Now, um, this, is, um, this is the group that went, that was, uh, went with mom on the death march. There were 10 women who stuck together. Almost all of them were Dutch. They, uh, they made the trip from Auschwitz to Ravensbrück and they, remain close after the war. This is a picture taken in a reunion, probably in, a, in the early 50s. This is my mother here on the, on the bottom left. I have to tell you about this woman here, the top, top uh, in the back. Her name is Yanni. Uh, her married name was Yanni Vandekar. When she and mom went to the camp, they arrived at about the same time. Yanni they had gone to school together as, as uh, elementary school. And Yanni grabbed my mother's hand and she said, do you remember me? And of course, mom did. And Yanni said, I don't know what's gonna happen to us, but no matter what, 
um, we're gonna we're gonna stick together, and they did. And um, just to show you how close it was, Yanni's number was six two five zero six. Only five numbers from my mother's number. Okay, here's the big secret Yanni had when she went to the camp. She was married. She also was pregnant. They had a benevolent, kind guard that kept Yanni hidden away through most of her pregnancy. I don't know how they did it, but she was able to deliver the baby. She could not keep the baby, but uh, she was able to have it there in the camp. And after the Holocaust, only Yanni and my mother were the only ones of this group that were able to have children. Um, and Yanni and mom stayed close forever. Um, I'm still in contact with Yanni's daughter. She's in Israel. Her son became a doctor. He was in the Chicago area. Unfortunately, he died in, in his 40s. Uh, I remember him. I remember him, you know, when we were kids. He was about my age. Um, and here's, here's where uh, mom and dad went to Israel to visit with Yanni and her husband. And then they came to Shreveport in 1977 and the Shreveport Times did a story and you can see how, how great a picture that is. Um, now, here is dad and the four men with which he left Auschwitz. Let me tell you the story on dad. This is what saved his life. Dad was, was helping SS guard count prisoners. Uh, they were in a mining camp uh, and uh, dad was helping the guard uh, as he took a roll. Well, dad lost track of what he was doing and it teed off the guard and he picked up a steel hammer and he hit dad on the, le on the right elbow. Okay, my dad had one scar from the war and it was a white spot on his right elbow, inside of his right elbow. And that, because that guard cut him open. And so dad got sent to the, to the Camp Mine Hospital. Well, at that point, the Russians were advancing and the Nazis abandoned camp. They took prisoners with them on a march, but they left the 27 men that were in the hospital, including dad. And it was very quiet in that, in that uh, hospital for a couple of days and they realized the Nazis were gone. And then the Russians came in and they told dad and the others, you're free to go. And off they went. My dad, instead of going west, which, which was not particularly safe, they went east. And they, th these four guys roamed through uh, Hungary and Romania and they ended up in the uh, Odessa, which was then part of Russia, now it's Ukraine. And they caught from there, they caught a boat back to Marseille. But, on that trip, on that walking trip, and they were hitchhiking and they were begging for food. They were going house to house and they were singing songs and they were putting on boxing exhibitions, anything to get money and to get food. And uh, if you knew my dad, you knew that he was uh, a, a man with a lot of pride. And yet I, it really hurts me to know that he had to, to beg, you know, and, and, and try to get money and food any way he could. Um, the man on the far right in the front, Jack Frankenhouse, um, he returned to Holland. And I wrote about him in a blog piece a couple of years ago after his daughter contacted me on Facebook. She had seen this picture and she had seen my post in my blog about, about this picture. And so she contacted me and I wrote the story about Jack Frankenhouse. Um, now about Auschwitz, I know there are people that have gone back that have gone there to visit. It's not anything that I ever desire to do. Just, just can't do that. It, it would just tear me up. It's hard enough for me to go to the Dallas Holocaust Museum. I've not been to the US Holocaust Museum in Washington. Um, but dad went, dad went back in 1952. He returned to Auschwitz. Uh, he was among the Dutch delegation that uh, laid a mon that dedicated a monument there. And he was one of the two people chosen uh, to dedicate the Dutch part of it. And then in 1985, he returned to Germany. The German government called him. They had a, a 
Nazi guard that they had, an old guy that they had caught and they had put him on trial and they wanted dad to come to come testify against him. Well, dad, they called him and they, he told him, he said, I don't remember the guy. And, uh, and, and he said, he wasn't really keen to go, but uh, they called him a couple of times and then uh, they paid for the trip. And so dad, dad was willing to go on the trip. And um, of course he took a side trip to Holland with it, but uh, he testified against the guy and told him he didn't remember him. But uh, anyway, uh, I think the guy was, was found guilty. Don't know what happened. But sure he's not alive now. Here's the, here's the camps. Uh, you can see these, these are the ones just in Poland. You can see Auschwitz down here. Uh, it's in the far south. And, uh, and this is just, this is just, like I said, in Poland, you, you can, you can imagine how many there were in Germany and in other places, 40,000 concentration labor POW and internment camps in Germany and in Poland. And of course the front gate, uh, which may work makes you free. You saw a little of that in the video. And of course it's total, total BS. And the big symbol of the Holocaust was uh, Anne Frank. I'm sure many of you are familiar with her story. Um, hidden away in Amsterdam. And of course the Anne Frank Museum is one of the big attractions there. Uh, and they were betrayed, her family was betrayed. Otto Frank ended up in the camps and he ended up like dad did in Odessa and, and uh, was on one of those boats back uh, that, that went back to Marseille, France. Um, and here's some, here's, uh, this is from a, like a Life Magazine special edition and you can read about what happens when people go to the camp. Um, you know, the one, the, they, they picked out the ones they wanted to, to live and, and work for them. And, and so many of them went right to the right and went to the gas chambers. My, my uh, grandmother and, and Jonas, dad's youngest brother, were sent to Sobibor, which was uh, strictly a death camp. It's on that map that I showed you just a minute ago. Um, my mother heard that he, her dad had to dig a ditch and was one of those that was shot and buried in that ditch. Okay. Here are the numbers. You can see the awful numbers. Um, just train after train you know, that went from these holding camps and went to the, the death camps and to the Auschwitz. My mother and dad uh, met in Amsterdam. They, did, they had not known each other. Um, mom was in a, uh, a converted factory that they made uh, uh, for uh, Holocaust, women Holocaust survivors, except one couple that was Yanni and her husband. Uh, they were in the attic of that, of that um, of that factory or that barracks. And uh, so dad went there. He knew Yanni's husband slightly, but he went with a friend who, who also knew Yanni's husband. And, uh, and they suggested, hey, you need to meet this, this woman over here. This is Yanni's best friend. And so they met, they started dating. And here you go. A year later, they're married. Um, and uh, they, dad uh, wanted to go back to Antwerp. Mom went with him. She didn't like it. Uh, after, after a short time, maybe six weeks or, or so, she said, I want to go back to Amsterdam. And let me tell you, when Rose wanted something, uh, Rose got it, okay? She, she ran the place there. Dad was a great guy, but he, he knew when to say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, and then uh, mom found out a year slightly after they got married that she, she wasn't feeling well. She went to the doctor. The doctor said, you're pregnant. Mom said, you're crazy. Uh, she did not believe it. She could not believe it. She did not think she would have children. Uh, she was not in very good health. She had a very difficult pregnancy, but uh, there I am. And I was born at seven months, two and a half pounds. I was in an incubator for, for more than two months, but uh, here they are. Um, 
My dad's wearing his streetcar uniform. This is the job he got when he went back to Amsterdam. He, he had to beg for the job, but they gave it to him. Um, he wasn't quite qualified height wise, but uh, he told him he badly needed a job. It was a job he had for eight years. He loved it. Um, and he was about to get a promotion when, when uh, they had already decided to move to the United States. My sister came along four, four years later, no problems with her pregnancy. Uh, and so here we are as kids. Um, and then this great day, once we got to the United States, um, these, this greatest day, May 23, 1961, very proud of this. Mom and dad worked really hard to, to become good citizens. Uh, they love this country. They never forgot Holland, uh, but they love this country. And, uh, and so the thing they were most proud of was uh, that we got a family. We got a family out of this. Um, this is, uh, as you can see, 1988. And, um, and now um, I'm proud to say that there are now nine great grandchildren. There are four on my side, on our side being my side, and then five on Elsa's side. And I imagine Elsa's side is not done yet. We're done. <laughs> this is the last picture of us together. This is at Rachel's wedding. Um, yeah. And then, uh, in 1996, mom and dad both did interviews uh, for the Shoah Foundation as that did uh, Holocaust survivors all over. Uh, these are available online. Um, my dad did not speak English that well, but uh, he did this interview. And uh, I based much of my book that I did on his interview. Uh, stories he told. I wish I'd asked more questions, um, but I didn't. And you can see how he's smiling here. Uh, he's, uh, I think it's because he was done with the interview. Uh, Dad was, uh, he had a great sense of humor, but he, he was not a jokester. Now my mother was, she was a little bit nuts, okay? <laughs> she would pull some pranks and she was, she was funny. Uh, Dad, um, you know, he always enjoyed a good joke, but he, he wasn't, he was a good storyteller. His stories and his, his whole tale was probably a lot more varied and more interesting than my mother. But um, here's dad at A.A. Gilbert Pison Supply. Believe me, he did not dress up like this uh, every day. Okay, but good picture, great place. It's torn down now, sad about that. Um, I've often been asked what it's like uh, to be the child of two Holocaust survivors. It was a, a, a learning experience. There was a lot of love in our home. Uh, there was also a lot of anxiety, stress and tension and a lot of anger. There were a lot of uncomfortable moments through the years. My dad was a gentle guy. I guarantee you, I gave him more trouble than he gave me. Uh, my parents were, they were really beautiful people. They were engaging, they, they were talkative, they, they talked to anybody that asked them about the Holocaust or anything else. Um, they were not afraid to talk about it. A lot, of, a lot of Holocaust survivors did not like talking about the Holocaust. Uh, my parents balanced that well. They weren't obsessed with it and they were, they were very honest and direct about it. Um, I, my mother, uh, she was very sweet. She loved sweets. She loved eating sweets. She loved whipped cream. She was a great cook. She was, a, uh, B will tell you, she was an exceptional pastry chef. Um, she would have been great at the dessert tables here at Trinity Terrace, uh, making the desserts and then eating them. Um, she was a great seamstress. She made money for us in the early years in the United States as a seamstress. She also was uh, very fiery. Uh, there was a rage within her. Uh, she had a temper and that uh, came off to us. Um, maybe it was a result of the residue, res, uh, a residue of the Holocaust. She was the disciplinarian in our house. Uh, I felt her wrath often enough and Rose's wrath was not something you wanted. There was uh, 
there's survivor's guilt. I'm, I'm sure that that bothered her a lot. She, you know, it's I am alive and the rest of my family isn't. And why God is that? What did I do to deserve, to deserve this? Uh, Dad was a lot more calm about it. Uh, there were things he didn't like. He didn't. He never warmed up to Germany. I can tell you that he was never going to ride in a Volkswagen. Um, he was not going to to buy German products. I think he might have liked Dirk and whiskey because he liked basketball. Um, my mother at times uh, was very depressed. Um, she had a tough time dealing with life. She darn near died in 1957 uh, with a, a mental breakdown that, and she also developed pneumonia. Um, thankfully she made it, but there were times that she just was just mentally exhausted and she had to be hospitalized. And this went on throughout her life. Um, when I was a kid, when we, when we first moved to Sunset Acres in 1957, she had a few days there where she just had screaming fits. And you know, when you're, when you're 12 or 11 years old and my sister was, was seven or eight, those things, they stick with you. Uh, my mother you know, was just totally out of control and she had to have a lot of help. Um, she was just afraid of counseling. She never went to counseling. Um, she was just afraid of it. And I, I can tell you now she, she could have used it and so could we, we could have used it when we were young. Um, there's been studies recently that show that uh, PTSD is associated with Holocaust survivors and it, go, it goes on to the kids and um, we always knew that what my parents had been through. They talked to us about it a lot. Um, we knew what the tattoos were about. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they, were, uh, they were determined to tell their story and they did. And then at the end, uh, you can see that uh, my dad was honored with a, a column here by Jerry Bird, my good friend, sports writer friend in Shreveport. And my mother had lots of great publicity, even to the end. And then I love this picture. Uh, this was taken in about 1960. Uh, we're out at, this is a Dutch reunion. We went out there every Easter and uh, just a great picture. I love that picture. And then this is the last picture of them right here. The last one together. This is, this is on the front porch, uh, Shaw Drive in Shreveport. Um, Dad basically uh, passed out here and went to the hospital and died the next morning in, in, uh, in 2008. And mom, two years later, we, we, we wanted to get her moved to a place, but she just wouldn't go, neither would dad. They would not go to a, a senior's residency, although Shreveport has some nice ones. And um, my mom fell on the front porch here, picking up the newspaper, broke her hip, and she just didn't have enough strength to, to recover. She, she had surgery and she died six weeks later. But we're real proud of them. Um, you know, they, they never gave up. My mother and dad never, never gave up. And it's why they went through the Holocaust in the first place. So I've gone long enough. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, Lisa. So thank you so much for being our Vantine speaker. Um, hang on just a second. I think there might be, yeah, people are just saying thank you in the chat. Um, a link has been shared too for that PBS um, uh, article about extremists in Europe. So you might wanna check that out folks if you head to the chat. And also know that um, you can listen to a centenary podcast. Let's see if I can pull that up quickly. Um, that features Rose Van Tyne speaking to a class um, some years back. I might not be able to pull that up quite quickly enough to send that to you. But if you search Centenary's website for Rose's name, you will come across that podcast very easily. All right, well, we'll sign off for the evening. Everyone um, have a wonderful weekend. And uh, Nico, again, thank you so much for being here tonight. I wish we could have done this in person, but this is really the next best thing. It's great seeing you. Well, thank to everybody for tuning in. Uh, I hope I didn't keep you too long. If you have any questions, you can email me.
or uh, contact me on Facebook. I'm glad to answer them. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.